Europe's second worst COVID-19 outbreak showed no signs of improvement as the death toll surpassed 1,700 and close to 30,000 cases were reached Sunday in Spain. Called for the 2020 Olympic Summer and Games to be postponed. the virus is making its march across the country. More than half the states in the U.S. now seeing cases go up. The map this coronavirus spreads, breaking caseload records day after day. The coronavirus after day. death toll in Italy now greater than China's. More than 3,400 people in Italy have died from the virus. China, where the outbreak originated, reported a national more than 3,200 deaths. The alarming new unemployment ICU number. ICU beds here are nearly full, but 70% of the people using them don't the have COVID-19. The global travel advisory will be raised to a level four. That's the highest possible. We're concerned that there is a level of alarm in the community that is unwarranted Another right now. One and a half million people filed for unemployment benefits last week. That's 47 million people. The U.S. has struggled to test large numbers of patients because of flawed testing kits, a lack of supplies, and strict regulations. And every American to postpone elective surgery. New coronavirus surges, new single day records in Alabama, Mississippi, Missouri, Nevada, and Texas. You might feel like we're done with COVID 19, uh, but COVID 19 isn't done with us. Like you, I see the way the news portrays what is going on throughout the world right now. And of course, the first instinct, the first reaction is fear because we don't understand it. We don't know it. Therefore, we fear it. And the news tells us that there are so many people testing positive. The hospitals is, are a war zone and so on and so forth. So naturally, we're going to be afraid. But is this the smartest way to go about this? You need to weigh the pro versus the con. Pro obviously being everyone is afraid, everyone stays inside, no one ever leaves, therefore no one is exposed. Con, mass hysteria, bankruptcy, broken families, unemployment, the loss of what was a booming market, and that's not including the long-term psychological or emotional effects that's going to happen due to the isolation. So in an attempt to further understand this thing that we are being told to be afraid of, I would get insight from various medical personnel on the front lines, as well as looking at the statistics for my local area. Like you said, I, I have been doing this for a while. Uh, been in the medical field for about 25 years. I just kind of feel like at one point in time, everybody's going to catch this illness, just like the flu, just like the, the plague. It's, it's, you know, not that extreme, but I mean, people do die from the flu every day. I think it's, people are scared of what they don't understand. There's no vaccine as of yet. Um, that's what scares a lot of people too. Uh, the people that are dying from this illness are the elderly, the people with weaker immune systems, uh, people that have uh, other underlying conditions such as cancer, they're going through radiation, their immune system's down, people that are on uh, immunosuppressants, uh, they're the ones that are actually going to be um, more likely to, to suffer harder in this illness. Um, the media likes to push out numbers and make it seem more dramatic than what they are. I don't know, I think society, you know, is doing partly the right thing. I just think the media has pushed uh, a little too far on the scare tactics and the extremity about the numbers and, and how it's not true that you get the corona and you're going to die. That's not true at all. And I, I, I feel that simply washing your hands and better hygiene for everybody else will, would make a better protection against this illness. If you could change the way the media, the stuff that the media puts out, how, how, what do you think that they should do? I think they should hire somebody in the medical field to help with the news. And I think, you know, try to help ease uh, peace of mind of some of these individuals. The scare with, these, with, the, with the public is, is getting to the point to where everybody wants to get tested. Everybody, oh, I have a sore throat, I'm going to the hospital. We, we have about 16 ambulances. There's been times where all of them are out. People calling for the simplest things. Hey, I, I don't feel good, I feel ill, my stomach hurts, I have a fever. You know, I mean, we're not gonna ever deny anybody patient care. You know, they wanna go to the hospital, they, you know, that's what we're here for. But they need to keep in mind that, because we're getting to the point where we have zero ambulances and they're all tied up with people thinking they have corona, but yet we have about two other patients out there dying and not breathing in cardiac or respiratory arrest, which we can't get to now because they're all tied up to the hospital. 
the hospitals are becoming to the point where they're going on the ER diversion. They're asking all the ambulances not to come here. It'll give us a tight span, you know, hey, there's uh, an eight-hour diversion from 8 till 2 p.m. That's letting us know, like, hospital's full. If you want to go to the hospital via ambulance, it's going to be a two, three-hour plus wait. And I think that is the most hurtful thing with this scare that Lee is doing. They don't realize what they're doing, but, you know, they're going out there, you know, giving false numbers. You know, COVID, you die. COVID, you die. Okay person has COVID, and that's all you see on Facebook, that's all you see on the news right now. So people, yeah, of course, they're going to be scared, they're going to be terrified, and I'm going to get it, I need to go get checked out, I need to, it's in their mind, and it's like a domino effect, it's going to hurt something else down the line. As of 24 June 2020, over 36,000 people in Hidalgo County, Texas, thought they had COVID-19. Only 2,500 tested positive, that is roughly 6%, and over 800 have recovered. 29 deaths stem from the 2,500 for a 1% mortality rate. As of 24 June 2020, over 1.8 million people in Texas thought they had COVID-19, 126,000 tested positive. Again, that is roughly 6% and 75% have already recovered. 2,249 deaths stem from the 126,000 for again a 1% mortality rate. Keep in mind, this is a rough estimate of a mortality rate because the total includes any death that involved COVID-19, not deaths that are attributed to COVID-19. More on this later. What, what we've been seeing so far is that we have basically two phases, you know, the one that you have no symptoms, and then you start to develop some symptoms, and then some of them just go down the hill. It looks like people is believing more of what the news is showing about that, 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 and they are forgetting that uh, the great number. People will survive. You're going to get sick. You need to improve and keep a good thought, positivity, and you'll get better. We are too worried about dying and forgetting that most of the people even. I don't think people is aware that if you are positive, that's not mean that you're going to die. Tonight, several cases that I'm talking with my patients, try to not think on the negative side, but try to see the 98% that people survive. I'm afraid that the media is doing a negative work on this. I'm not saying we neglect those numbers, but I think we should be careful because a population is a fear population is used to be manipulated. Not only that, look at the consequence of this. You start bombarding that term. You need to protect, 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 protect yourself. You need to be isolated. In a little while, you're going to see couple married, they'll start divorcing. Abuse, barrier, physical abuse will be increased. Suicidal thoughts will be increased. Until what point it's good to have this social isolation and what a price is going to pay. Not only that, imagine with this, how many small businesses will be broken. People have food to buy, they have car to pay, they have house to pay. Once you don't have a job, you lose the, the pace of income, the social pressure as a consequence for this isolation. I have an impression that uh, this is going to be worse, socially speaking. If the media helps to give chips how we take care, better care of ourselves, more than just negative, 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 would be better. But what sells is the negative. People is watching news because of the negative, not the positive. Imagine, not imagine the consequence of this, how many families broken, how many kids will have trouble now eating or depend more dependent on the government and it go to a moment where there will be no money. If we don't generate money, the government won't have money to help the people that need it. As of 24 June 2020, the United States has had over 2.3 million positive COVID-19 cases. Approximately 120,000 have resulted in death, which is a 5% mortality rate. In this chart, we see that patients over the age of 65 constitute nearly 60% of hospitalized patients, followed by the age range 50 to 64, which constitute nearly 30%. The lower the age, the more drastic the drop. Remember, the death total includes all deaths involving COVID-19, not just deaths resulting from COVID-19. To get an accurate number of deaths stemming from prior illnesses rather than those who only became sick because of COVID-19 is difficult. However, we know that COVID-19 often leads to pneumonia. So if we take the number of deaths that subtracts influenza, we have approximately 47,000. This coincides with our earlier mortality rate patterns of 1%. Think you've been exposed to the corona, or you may have symptoms that have been uh, mentioned on the news. We do recommend you call your primary doctor, let them know what it is you're feeling or why you think you may have been exposed. 
From there, your doctor can decide whether they want you to get tested or not. If you're able to manage your symptoms, then you should stay home and stay quarantined for the 14 days. If you're not able to manage your fever, you're, you know, you're giving your medicine, your Tylenol, your Motrin, you're rotating, but it, you're still having difficulty controlling it and it keeps going above like 103, then yes, I would recommend you then go in, try and get some treatment. Maybe they need to give you some IV fluids. Maybe from there you will have to be admitted. But a percentage of the people that come in to get seen, at this point, I would say probably about 85% of people are coming in for that reason. Because they think, oh, I have it, and they're scared, and they think, you know, I'm, I'm not going to make it. That's the other thing. People that actually are coming into the emergency room for other things, they're terrified. Because they hold out as long as they can, because they're like, well, we don't want to come, we don't want to come. Especially if they're bringing in their child. You know, they're like, I was trying to avoid it, and they're, you know, they're scared, of course, because now they're in a hospital where they've been told by the news, it's crazy in there, everybody in there has COVID, everybody's positive. Once you step in, that's it, you're going to get it kind of deal. So I've seen a lot of concerned parents that hold off on bringing their child because of that reason. I feel the news only mentions the negative things. They're not mentioning how many people are actually able to stay home and just manage their symptoms and get over the actual virus on their own. I really believe they shouldn't just try to scare people. We have people calling in and asking like, if I go in, am I gonna be positive and then I'm gonna have to go to ICU. I think the best thing for them to do would be to actually educate the public. Um, that's the main thing that we're working on right now anytime we have anybody come in or call in. Um, as far as patients go, we're doing a lot of educating. Everybody's seeing the news and they're like, well, I don't know, I heard, you know, my cousin's boyfriend's friend had it and well, last time, you know, I walked in the room and they were there, so now I'm here and I think I have it. With zero symptoms. And then we just have to educate them and inform them of like I was telling you, even if you, even with symptoms, it's not recommended you head out and go to the emergency room to, you know, get admitted, at least that's what people think. Or they're also thinking, I'm gonna go to the emergency room because I need to get tested. The other thing about testing is you have to meet a criteria in order to get tested. It's not just, oh, I'm, I wanna get tested because I feel like I might have it, or because I have this symptom, you know, that they mentioned, like one symptom. There's a criteria they have to meet in order to be able to get tested. Um, and the reason for that is also because, like I said, even if you test positive, doesn't mean that we're going to put you in the hospital. It means we're probably going to send you home and just tell you to control your fever. That's what it is. Control your vomiting. We might give you something to help you with your vomiting. But the best thing is for everybody to stay home the 14 days. Just take care of your symptoms at home. If you progress and things get worse, like you do have difficulty breathing, then of course, yes, that's when you would make a move and go into the emergency room, but I think education is what needs to be done, not just a scaring tactic. Me, myself, I just tested positive. I'm cur currently on quarantine. As far as my experience goes, I basically had symptoms that only lasted maybe three to four days, and the worst was probably day two, which was just a low-grade fever for me for maybe 12 hours, and that was it. I didn't have any other kind of vomiting, nothing like that. I had a little bit of nausea, like I said, for three to four days, but not nothing severe. I was still able to eat. My appetite was there. The only thing I had was kind of a foggy headache. It, was, it didn't feel like migraine headache. It didn't feel like a pressure headache. I would describe it as a foggy headache. It was there. It wasn't extremely painful. It was just bothersome. Like I said, I'm a nurse and I'm in the emergency room. To be honest with you, it wasn't, am I going to get it? It's so when am I going to get it? Um, I honestly believe we're, we're all going to get it, especially us in the medical field. Along with some of my coworkers, we had discussed it and we all knew. We, we know it's not, are we going to get it? It's a when are we going to get it? Please remember, this is not to neglect the deaths of those who have lost their lives. Every life is precious, and one death is one death too many. This is for perspective, in hopes that people in the media don't only focus on one facet of the entire picture. Wear your masks in enclosed or crowded areas. Stop taking away care from patients who truly need it. 
Stop crowding hospitals, ambulances, and test sites. If you experience symptoms, call your provider for guidance and self-quarantine as you would for any sickness. If you reside with ill elderly individuals, take extra precautions. This is a marathon, not a sprint. Like every single other pandemic virus in history, this is going to be around for years. Mass lockdown is simply not feasible for that long. Pray that the virus does not evolve and please know that you are not alone. God bless you all.